and she, my wife is like, ah, that's why I didn't marry someone good looking. <laughs> what? 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 Like, so that's a double headed backhand compliment. <laughs> so we, 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 ad uh, we adopted Marvella. And of course, when I posted up the photos online, oh, I then started like, the, the netizens. There was a lot of support, a lot of support from hey, Harit, that's amazing, that's awesome. The, then there were those who suddenly, all the little imams came out of the woodwork, <laughs> all the ustaza who, you know, suddenly like sending me all the, all the sentences from the Quran, the Sharia, the royal law, you know. Banyak panjas. I'm like, why? You take so much time to type all this, is it? <laughs> Uh, they were telling me, you know, hukum hukum, boleh simpan anjing, you know, you know, tak boleh simpan, hanya boleh simpan anjing kalau dia menjaga tanah, tanaman, you know, you can only keep a dog if it keeps your garden. I have chili trees. <laughs> I got mint leaves growing in my garage, okay? I, I like, Marvella, jaga! <laughs> Marvella, like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Seriously, he's, I tell you, don't mess with Marvella. He can hop on his big leg. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I tell you, you know, he's scary. Like, he's scary. So that's, you know, but that's the thing though, because, uh, you know, getting too sensitive nowadays. Everything sensitive. Terlalu sensitive. We were talking about it. And sensitive. I remember like about a year and a half ago, uh, there was this case of this, this guy, Malay guy, went into a giant hypermarket, went into the non-halal section, took out his phone, and there was a, a girl, Chinese girl, like, giving away free samples of beer. And he took out his phone. He thought he was going to be a hero, started, you know, videotaping her. And he started abusing her. Apa ni? You know, ni negara Melayu, apa kau bagi beer? And she's like, no, I, you know, I'm just doing my job. And he was like trying to be a hero, accusing her of like, you know, trying to spoil the Muslims and all. And she's like, no, he said, no, in her section, what are you doing here? <laughs> And he posted it online. Of course, it backfired on him. He got a lot of abuse from people. Even, and I felt embarrassed. As a Malay Muslim, I have to say, I, I was, the moment he did this, oh, Allah, I have to be a Malay guy doing it. <laughs> I felt embarrassed. As a Malay Muslim, I felt embarrassed. Because I've been going to Giant for years, and I've been buying my beer. I didn't know they give for free. I, I didn't know. I thought, I, 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 if I knew, I would have been, <laughs> don't judge me once again. You all, you all judging me. Lah. Come on, lah. I don't I don't drink beer. I buy for Assalamualaikum, good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome once again to another episode of What's Going On Malaysia. My name is Harith Iskandar. Thank you so much everyone for joining in. Um, it is a Saturday night. Thank you for spending your time with us. If you're watching this live, awesome. We've already got so many people commenting uh, from YouTube on Facebook. Hello SJ Su, Majiha Gopalan, good evening from Sunway. Um, I know the program is watched um, by so many people uh, all over the place. Hello, Sandra, how are you doing? Uh, and uh, it's it's always exciting to see so many new names coming up. A lot of people are also repeat uh, viewers. Thank you so much for watching. Shazil Ali, good evening. Uncle Harry from Salahuddin. Sumaya Suhailia Banda Nusaru Sha'Allah. All right. Uh, the way you're talking, uh, I'm, I'm feeling like I need to know you or I, I do know you. And um, are, you, are we cousins? I'm not so sure. Because you know, lah, Malay families, not only are we haven't seen each other for two years, but we're huge. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you so much for, for watching. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, please uh, do me a huge favor. And immediately, as I am speaking, share this streaming. All right? Because tonight's episode, uh, particularly exciting for me, because uh, the moment I, I posted up about 
the guest that was going to be on my show tonight, uh, it was inundated with messages from people like, oh, wow, we've not, we've not heard from a, in such a long time. We've not heard from your guest. And, you know, we're all excited. So I'm excited. Now I'm, I'm also very nervous now because uh, now you guys are excited for me and, I, and I've become a little bit nervous. So, Assalamualaikum, Botak Bro, Said Roslan, speaking it like it is. Judging from your pictures, Said Roslan, we are brothers in hell, hell lost dumb, I would say. Guys, I, I'm assuming you can see me and hear me clearly. Uh, if, if that is the case, I'm going to go straight into the show. What's going on Malaysia? Um, yes, the TV is off. Uh, I just want to, this, this is the TV and it is off and I know it's very black, but don't worry. Uh, it, we will we will jump straight into the topic, which is, in fact, we've got a lot of topics to cover tonight. In fact, I don't know whether we have enough time to cover all the topics we're going to cover, but we're going to try and get through all of them. The, the guest I'm about to bring into the studio right now is um, someone who uh, I personally have uh, had a lot of admiration for. Um, a lot of respect for, uh, and uh, I'm so glad she agreed to come onto the show. Uh, and uh, you know what? I'm not going to hold the suspense any longer. You know uh, as well as I do who uh, this special guest is. So please uh, help me welcome to the show. If you're at home watching on your device, just just clap, just clap. I can't hear you. We can't hear you, but the energy of clapping will travel through the universe. And I will feel it. So, ladies and gentlemen, dengan tidak membuang masa lagi. I love the way sportscasters always say that after talking for 30 minutes. Dengan tidak membuang masa lagi, after wasting 30 minutes. Please welcome uh, into the uh, studio of What's Going On Malaysia, Latifa Koya. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Good evening and thank you so much for being uh, a guest on What's Going On Malaysia. So, first of all, um, are you well? Everything okay? Uh, we're in this pandemic, almost 18 months now. How are you How are you doing personally on that? So far, so good. Um, haven't had any real exercise, but yeah, it's uh, it's been uh, weird. But at the same yeah. time, back to practice, yeah. Yeah, it, it has been weird, hasn't it? Um, I presume you've been... I get used to it, actually. Get, working from home, you're getting used to it? No, no, no! Not working from home. I'm actually, I actually go to office, so ah. I can never get used to this whole mask no. thing and yeah, seeing empty roads. No. Oh well, the roads are not empty anymore. I oh, yeah. <laughs> have That's you been true. outside? Yes, I have. <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay, so uh, uh, well, okay. First of all, uh, formalities aside, how, how by what name do I refer to you as you are speaking informally on okay. this show? Well, I'm known as Latifa, or people uh, close to me calls me Lat. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll call you Latifa for now. But sure, uh, no so you you are a lawyer, and I take it you are back to to being a lawyer uh, yes. after uh, after your um, experience uh, as a chief of the MACC. So uh, what what's been okay? Well, We'll get back to that in a moment. But what's been going on since then, once once you stepped down from the MACC uh, up to this point? Well, um, after I stood down, uh, stepped down in March last year, uh, I had to get back to my, you know, basically we have to apply back our practicing cert. And since then, I've been, um, uh, you know, back to being a lawyer and um, also going back into uh, uh, um, advising the organization I used to be active with, which is the Lawyers for Liberty. Okay. Which is an NGO that deals with uh, human rights issues. And we will be talking about that in just a moment. So uh, d just so that my audience and myself understand this. So when you uh, join the, the government, government position, you are meant to leave or close your office? How does it work? Yeah. Um, when you take up such a position, uh, you can't practice. So you will have to actually notify the bar and say that you no longer practice. And uh, so if you want to join back, you will have to apply back and get your PC. They call it PC. Practicing. Ah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so 
Did that take a while to get used to, or were you like, oh, let's get straight back into it? Uh, no, 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 um, because it was a short stint uh, anyway for me. So going back wasn't really a problem. Um, and while I was there, of course, I have to keep reminding myself I'm no longer a lawyer. Uh, you know, I'm is you know wearing a totally new different hat. So uh, going back to practice, it wasn't difficult actually. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I know you, you have probably been asked this question a thousand times since you left, but what was your experience your, your, during the time that you were chief of MACC? Like just in general, when you look back on it in hindsight, uh, you know, what are your, how, how would you, like if you were to write a memoir about it, how would you describe that, that, that experience of being in that position? Well, um, of course it was surreal to a certain extent because suddenly you are placed in a position where, uh, you've been given a lot of power to to do, uh, you know, uh, basically, of course, in, in this case, uh, anti-corruption uh, um, work. And it was um, definitely a very steep learning process for me. Um, and this is the first time, uh, you know, you are taking charge of not just a, an office, but a whole, uh, you know, a set of enforcement agencies, which... Uh, there are about at least um, four to five thousand staff yeah, under you, uh, so that was um, quite an experience, and no regrets there. Um, uh, it was one exciting uh, uh, time for me, actually. Uh, I had, I had my, my interesting experience, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> so Grace Philip is asking: Was it daunting to go against corrupt officials while at MACC? It's always daunting to go after anybody, um, you know, you're using your power. So, of course, um, investigating people, uh, using your power to arrest them, yeah, those, those things. But, of course, uh, as, a, as a chief, you don't actually, actually do it yourself. You have your offices and there are various, um, you know, processes and procedures and you're supposed to oversee the whole thing. Did I hear you say earlier the 4,000 people under you at that time? Uh, yes, that would include the actual uh, MACC officers as well as what you call uh, administrative, um, you know, uh, civil servants who could be in MACC or could be placed in any other places as well. So basically, um, there's a huge number of people and various departments, and they also spread across the whole nation. So you have um, state uh, uh, you know, uh, offices as well, uh, uh, state departments as well for, for MACC. So, yeah, so it, it's huge in that way. Just, it's not as just, big as the police. It's not as big yeah. as the police uh, force. Of, of course not. But uh, let, let me ask, um, prior to that time that you became chief of MACC, as a lawyer, were you ever engaged in anything where you were dealing with the MACC from the outside as a lawyer? Yes, I had. Um, of course, I have to represent people who were arrested under MACC. And in fact, um, if one were to Google, I have in uh, challenged uh, MACC before. Uh, I've sued them before. For uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there, there is a case with my name versus MACC before. Yeah. Oh, uh, that that couldn't have been fun because the people who are already working there, like, oh, yeah, Nila, Nila, and kachokita ni. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I've I've met some of my uh, you know, uh, old, uh, I, I can't say uh, uh, um, uh, opponent, but some oh, old yeah. adversaries, yeah, but, but we're friends now. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so now that you've been in the MACC and you've experienced it, I mean, has anything changed in terms of your perception? Because prior to that, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're suing the MACC, right? Then one, at one time you're in the MACC. Now, given your experience, has, it, has anything changed in your mind about, oh, so this is how it works? Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, like I said, it was a very steep uh, learning process. The first month, uh, not only I have to understand the whole works, the whole structure and system, uh, but I also need to, you know, there's a certain uh, way of uh, dealing with issues because once you're a civil servant, uh, you know, you 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 have to. Uh, 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 for me, I have to take an oath of confidentiality, 
and it's not much different as a lawyer where you also have to uh, protect privilege. I mean, you you there whatever you you deal with your client is uh, privilege, but in a in a similar way, you take oath for confidentiality. So I have to be very careful. In fact, I I had to switch off all my uh, social media like Facebook, and I can't simply post things which I used to do uh, prior to that. Uh, so those things, um, it's, it's, it's a different world out there. But at the same time, I definitely came across um, so many things that I would not have known uh, had I not been uh, in that position. Um, for example, we always hear uh, MACC is all about arresting uh, persons and putting them in this orange lockup, uh, you know, T-shirts and, 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 and then, you know, dragging them to court. And, you know, in, in that process, people think, wow, action is being done. But there's a huge um, set of uh, other things. Uh, for example, the whole preventive measures that is being done, uh, where people uh, in the whole department called pencegahan. Uh, so it's not just about uh, you know enforcement per se, um, arresting people, but you also have to deal with how do you deal with a system which continues to have corruption uh, or corrupt offices or you know agencies like, for example, customs or. Uh, traffic uh, police, you always will hear people, you know, taking um, bribes or whatever. So how do you deal with that? It's not just about arresting hundreds of officers and say, yay, I've met the KPI, I've arrested this number of people, so therefore I must be doing my job well. But the idea is actually, if you have less and less uh, people that you arrest, that means something has been fixed, the system has to be fixed. So there's a whole department called um, prevention or pencegahan. Uh, and I uh, think that they have not been given that much highlight, you know, because uh, they, they do their work quietly and a lot of system and structures are fixed in that manner. So, yeah, so those, those are some of the things that I've learned once uh, when, I, I went, when I went in there. Yeah, uh, as you're talking about it, I... Don't think I've heard of that department called Pencegahan, which looks into yes. how to uh, address systems yes. which are already in play that that may need tweaking yeah. or adjusting or fixing. Oh. Yes, yeah. So it's actually oh. it's a, actually a, a huge department itself. So if you rem, if you look at the structure, you will have of course the uh, chief commissioner, and then you have deputy chief commissioners, and each deputy chief actually heads one or uh, one of those departments. So you have head of the enforcement, uh, head of prevention, and one is on uh, management uh, and organizational uh, matters. So uh, we only hear usually on the enforcement uh, uh, department because that is, of course, the more sensational uh, uh, part of MACC. But uh, equally important was the preventive uh, measures. And, and they, they do sometimes work together because if I've been arresting too many people from one particular agency, then there, we know there's, there's a problem. So we will send in the preventive officers to find out what's happening and then give them time to fix it. And if they fail to do so, then action can be taken uh, on that department and on the, on the head of that department for not fixing the loopholes or what caused, uh, you know, the problem. So, yeah, those things are also there. So, MACC is not just about orange T-shirts. Okay. I'm going to print a T-shirt that says MACC is not just about orange T-shirts. <laughs> I think that'll, that'll explain everything. Okay, now that you're out of the MACC, I understand about confidentiality and not being allowed to, to talk about uh, events or incidents or cases that happened while you were in the MACC, but now that you are out and you're looking at the current um, uh, MACC team, so to speak, uh, yeah. in your opinion, uh, how are they doing? Well, you should be asking the chief himself. <laughs> I'm just an ex, ex, uh, ex chief. Yeah, I mean, actually, to be to be to be honest, that once you've taken um, an oath of confidentiality, it's not just um, you know keeping it confidential while you're there, but it's also uh, important that you you continue to do so when you're out. You know, uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be fair to those officers who um, you know working under you, uh, who conducted those matters, because next time they would be afraid uh, to do so. 
because every time a departmental head or chief comes out, he goes and gives an interview and tell all and write a book. I'm not going to do that, you know. Yeah, I'm oh, not going okay. to. No, no, yeah. that, that makes sense. All right. So uh, you were mentioning earlier about lawyers for liberty and, and human rights and all. Okay, the, the, the term human rights gets bandied about and it pops up every now and then, almost to the point that uh, uh, I think it's lost some of its edge um, because, um, you know, you, you hear it too often. Too, it's like we've stopped looking at the numbers of cases because after a while it's like, okay, that, that doesn't mean anything anymore. But um, is it... I, what? Okay, let, let me just ask you in, in simple terms. So, uh, in Malaysia, human rights. What is Malaysia focused on, or rather, you and Lois Liberty? What What are they focused on? Uh, key areas of human rights, because there are, there are so many different areas. But what are the main ones that, as Malaysians, we should be concerned about? Well, um, of course, when it comes to human rights, there's so many issues, and you're right that the word human rights has been. Um, it's you know, everyone claims that uh, their human rights is breached or, you know, their rights has been breached when sometimes that's not the case. And, um, uh, yeah, you'll have to always uh, sieve through cases when people come to you and complain that your human rights, and, and you'll have to find out exactly which part of the human rights are you talking about. If you, you know, if you have been caught for stealing and then you've been arrested, and uh, that, that's not necessarily a human rights case. But if you've been caught stealing and then you've been arrested and then you're beaten, uh, you know, during interrogation, then the issue of human rights can come in. So it, you'll have to look at the situation and what happened. Uh, just the idea of being arrested itself is not a human rights issue. But uh, if you are arrested for speaking out, for example, then, you, you know, the issues come about. So for Lawyers for Liberty, we've been around for officially uh 11 years um in fact i think uh uh we started off uh 20 it's actually 10 years plus i would say um a bunch of us like-minded uh lawyers i don't want to call ourselves human rights lawyers but we we took up issues that could be considered in the category of human rights um we came in um you know to deal with issues of um people who are arrested um uh issues like death in custody, for example, or uh, police shooting, um, cases of uh, statelessness, people who are denied their rights um, uh, to, to nationality, or even people who were arrested for, uh, you know, sedition. Um, so many, so many types of cases where you can see that there, these are fundamental rights that are guaranteed, uh, not just under the the large category of human rights, but also under the federal constitution. Okay, let, let's go back to what you were talking about earlier, death in custody, because uh, I don't know whether it's just social media or um, it, it seems to be quite, what's the word? I would say prevalent. You know, it seems to be, at least in my social media feed, I'm, key, I'm being reminded of it every now and then uh, with a fairly new case popping up and then everybody says, oh, remember that case and that case and that case. Uh, how serious is this problem? Well, it is a serious, every case, um, you know, even one case would be considered serious because we are talking about people who, uh, you know, are found dead uh, in the custody of whether it's, um, uh, you know, the police force or whether it's in the immigration detention center or whether it's in, um, you know, under any other form of enforcement or power, uh, they, they, we would call it death in custody. Uh, so um, I think even one single case would, would be seen as serious. Uh, but I would think that a uh, long time ago, uh, um, you know, before these matters became a big deal, you normally would hear a person who's uh, who died in custody that there would be an excuse given um, that person was sick. Uh, we didn't know what happened. Uh, you know, the police will come out with a with a statement saying that um, we that there was nothing wrong, but you know, he either killed himself. You know, those those were uh, the way it was dealt. And and most Malaysians also looked at a person who's arrested as a person who's already, uh, you know. Uh, seen as a convict or or, or, or a criminal, uh, 
And when Lawyers for Liberty came uh, about, we started telling about it doesn't matter if the person is has been arrested. He has not been sentenced yet. You know, he's not been uh, in court yet. So you are innocent until proven guilty. And there, even as a detainee, even if you are in the prison, you are, are actually supposed to be protected by certain rights. Rights from being physically um, beaten. Rights from uh, rights to uh, have an access to a lawyer. Uh, you know, uh, rights to be treated if you are sick. Those are those are fundamental rights that needs to be uh, dealt with. So just because you died, be maybe because you were not given um, uh, medication, that's not all right. So why weren't why weren't that done? So after you know, we've raised a few cases. We've brought and dragged um, the officers. Uh, to court, we've got you know very good uh, judgment from the from the courts. I think we do feel there are some impact. Uh, people are talking about the setting up of IPCMC. We are talking about not just about having CCTV, but police being answerable, uh, police being charged for these things, or not just police, but even uh, immigration detention centers and things like that. So. Uh, how do you conduct an inquest? Uh, these have become quite, uh, you know, uh, mainstream. You know, to yeah. to 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 discuss these things have become a mainstream uh, issue. Those days, it wasn't. It was never popular to take up a death in custody case. But now, at the very least, um, people are ready to take up these cases. People are ready to speak out. Um, you know, assisting the family not just dealing with the grief, but how to address what happened, because sometimes people don't know um, what happened to their loved ones when they are arrested or, or found dead uh, in the middle of the road after a shooting, and they were told that the, apparently they had a parang in their car or um, they, they, there was a gunfight and, and, and then there was a shooting and these are wanted people. You know, So that's why we had that very... Uh, notorious case of that young boy, 15-year-old Aminul Rashid, who was shot um, for take for you know uh, he he took his mother's car and he he was driving and of course uh, he sh he 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 was an underage, but to be shot dead uh, uh, for for doing that, uh, those are some of the shocking stories that uh, woke people up as to what it means to be you know. Um, denied that basic right. Um, yeah, no, you, when you said the name, it reminded me of that case. Uh, hey, uh, uh, by the way, everyone who's watching, please um, continue to share this episode right now because I think we are actually uh, um, unearthing some very, very important points, a very impo important point of view about what's going, you know, are things getting better? And uh, on that note, please sh share this live streaming now. Are things getting better? Um, uh, we've had three governments in the last three years, I think. Um, I, in any other business, when you have a, a new change of leadership, you know, things tend to slow down, start back again. Uh, has this slowed anything down or are, are we heading in the right direction? Uh, as far as what you're talking about, what the lawyers of liberty are doing with human rights and, you know, Death, death in detention and death in custody and stuff. Are we? Has it stopped or is it moving forward? Are we getting somewhere with it? Well, I think there's definitely um, better uh, standards in terms of dealing with cases like this. Um, once upon a time, it was a struggle, not just ha having to make a police report. It was a struggle to uh, get the coroner uh, to 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 meet the pathologies. It's been a struggle to almost at every level when we're dealing with these kind of issues. Uh, but nowadays, um, not saying that uh, all, all is well and you know, good, but uh, definitely um, you know, uh, the, the officers or the agencies who probably um, you know, have cases such as these are more sensitive to it and are you know, better equipped in dealing with these issues, you know, uh, finding out who's the culprit, uh, taking up action, I it, of course, some of them will be very defensive, but I think it is much better in, compared to 
probably 10 years ago when we used to deal with these cases. Um, we used to rattle the gates and, you know, the police used to close the gates, not allow the lawyers in. Um, we have to prove that we were appointed by the family. Every level was, was a struggle. So in that context, I think we managed to push uh, certain standards or SOPs uh, that we could deal with. And we have pathologists who will actually brief us as to what happened uh, and, and give explanation to the family and the lawyers. Um, so these, these things um, are much better and inqu inquests are done in definitely in, uh, and called up in a, uh, uh, faster than those days. Um, and in fact, they have dedicated coroner's courts as well. So in that context, yes. But when it comes to issues of statelessness or um, other human rights issues, I think uh, it's it's uh, uh, a long a long struggle still. It's, it's, uh, we yeah. we are dealing with something which could have been sorted out. We had so much of, of opportunities, but I didn't see much uh, political will there. Yeah. Okay. When you say it could have been sorted out, we had so many opportunities. What exactly do you mean? When could it have been sorted out? At which well, point? Okay. These issues of statelessness and people who are denied uh, citizenship has been around for, for decades, I would say. Uh, in 2018, we, uh, you know, we were very hopeful um, with Pakatan Harapan, who had made a lot of promises. They have, in fact, had a written set of promises to deal with issues. Um, and they were there. And as soon as they got into power, we had hoped that some of these issues will be seen as priority. You can, you know, change these things. And um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, if one were to say that, oh, they were there only for 22 months, um, it doesn't take long to actually change uh, or amend certain bills or policies. Uh, and that didn't happen. Uh, for example, I would say the issue of citizenship. We have... Uh, you know, we have had ministries, uh, ministers who are supposed to be in charge on, uh, you know, the citizenship is not just about uh, an issue of discrimination against gender. But let's just take that part, since most people are, you know, uh, tuned in into that issue. Okay. The women's ministry had the opportunity to actually make that small amendment to add uh, the word mother in that particular clause, which we are now talking about. Uh, so there, there shouldn't be any difference between a father or a mother when it comes to a child that is born overseas to a Malaysian parent. But unfortunately, that wasn't done. In fact, nothing was done. And that issue is not something new. So, you know, all governments, um, and when it comes to these kind of issues, have uh, failed us. But I'm particularly sore because this, um, the government in 2018 gave a promise to deal with these issues. They were aware of it, you know, and, um, uh, and, and, and that didn't happen. And unfortunately, now we have um, a home ministry, which is, you know, uh, all the more um, uh, uh, resolute in denying uh, these rights. But when we had that opportunity, we kind of missed it. And that's not just for this issue. For many issues, actually. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I remember when uh, Pakatan Harapan uh, first won the general election, there was, you know, there was a feeling of a new dawn uh, and everyone mm -hmm. felt that, uh, you know, something was coming and uh, a big change was coming and then it's going to be progressive. And then, um, particularly with the manifestos, there were uh, issues on human rights, institutional reforms, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and 22 months and then nothing happened. Now, uh, as I hear it, most people from Pakatan Harapan went, well, it was only 22 months. But what I'm he hearing you say is a lot could have been done in 22 months. So, yeah. uh, and you say that you were particularly sore about this uh, yeah. the women's ministry. Um, well, I mean, it's not just the women's ministry, but of course, at that time, the whole ministry as well. But you could have dealt with it. You could have addressed that issue. Um, for example, uh, not just about, uh, you know, the issue of... Um, uh, uh, statelessness, even the issue of death penalty, for example, you know, death penalty, we could have uh, abolished it. But and we had a very good um, law minister, uh, minister uh, the late Datuk Sri VK Liu, 
uh, he was very passionate uh, when it comes to uh, uh, abolishing a death penalty. And well, we're all coming from that same group. Uh, but he had so he had uh, so much of um, uh, uh, stumbling block and challenges within his own government. Um, I know of uh, you know his struggle in in, in cabinet and all that when uh, he was trying to put the paper to to abolish the death penalty. What was their excuse? There wasn't a, a real excuse because these things are not something that you need to have a two third majority to to change. You can have a simple majority to to make those changes, uh, you know. But um, that didn't happen. So all it takes when it comes to amending is just one bill, an amendment bill, a amending bill. All it takes is just that. And how long do you need that? You don't need twenty two months for that, you know. So let's say the first sitting too short. Then you had another, and then you had another. You had so many sessions uh, in parliament where you, you didn't deal with it. And what is so difficult in drafting uh, um, amendment bill? So all these repressive um, laws that could have been uh, abolished by tabling one bill could have done, been done. I, I, I don't know what's the excuse, you know. So oh, I was going to ask you, why wasn't it done? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. So I, I would think that that's the disappointment. That's, that's the disappointment. So... Um, what do we do? You know, it's not like you didn't know what to do because you have promised it, you know. But yeah. of course, the current government um, with the Home Ministry who doesn't seem to, you know, think that these are things we should do, uh, that's another problem. Uh, you know, um, he, the, the Home Minister last year in December announced something which we thought it was, okay, we can welcome it, which was an SOP uh, as to someone who can, uh, when someone applies for citizenship, there will be an SOP that we're going to show that so that people don't wait for not just one year, two years or five years uh, and continue to be stateless. But he finally announced that he will have a, an SOP. But it's been now what, October? I've not seen any sign of that SOP. In fact, um, it got worse because there was a case in court and they were challenging it all the way, you know, even tried to strike out. So that's not good, you know. So we have a we have a long way to go when it comes to these kind of issues. Uh, I don't know what is the, the problem, but we, you know, past few, uh, since pandemic, everyone is talking about reform, you know, it's uh, reform and human rights and... You, it's it's strange. You 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 would even hear from those who were once uh, in in the establishment for decades using those words, you know, human rights and uh, reform agenda. We should change and de be democratic. Blah blah blah. Those things, you know. The, you, sometimes you cringe hearing it from uh, some of these individuals. But okay, fine. You say it, but it's all sometimes sounding very hollow. Yeah. You know, even recently, you you have people who say that, but it's hollow because what what does it mean when you say that you want to do a reform of the parliament? What do you mean by saying that? You know, if you had been given the power, would you do it? So, not trying to sound, I uh, don't mean to be cynical, but I think we need more than just you know words which sounds very popular, uh, and we need you know action. And when when we talk about action, we can do it now because since the, the both the government and the opposition uh, is they're no stranger. The opposition is no stranger to the idea of reform. The current government, I would say, may not be uh, used to it, but now they are talking about it, and they have managed to have some kind of what you call this um, memorandum of understanding. So bring it on, try it, test it bring it to the parliament and test it if that they mean it. So you can bring some of these issues, you know, and, and, and do the necessary change. Okay. I'm going to bring you an example. And then to my mind, it seems obvious the answer, but it's not. So, uh, so in, in September, we know that the high court ruled that children born out overseas to Malaysian mothers with foreign spouses should automatically be conferred citizenship. And then suddenly, uh, the, the 
the was it the who, who did I read that the, the government appealed that decision. So the yeah. government went okay. So okay, to me, kalau ikut logic lah, logic. Uh, Mata Malaysian, um, okay, let's say overseas, then child born in London and then brought back. Mm. Logically, to me, child is Malaysian. So what yes. is what is? I'm trying to hard to understand. So currently the law says no, and and if so, who who came up with that law and why is it so difficult? Is there are there other examples where you see the law will go well? You see if, if that happened, this is where the difficult part would happen, and then if this happened, this is where the difficulty. Then then I'd go oh, okay. There are many different angles to this, but to me, mother Malaysian, child Malaysian, that just makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So why, That, there is absolutely no logic to it. Um, in fact, I think because there's absolutely no logic to it, that the government actually um, said they will uh, make the amendments. We shall see. We will wait. But the fact that a judge has actually decided uh, to interpret the word father to mean also mother, because we have what you call an equality clause, Article Eight. In which, uh, in 2001, apart from race, religion, and 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 uh, um, other aspects of um, equality, the word gender was introduced. So when when the word gender was introduced in 2001, the judge said that where the word father, you need to synchronize uh, with the with the Article 8. So that means father should also mean mother, and we are also um, uh, you know. Uh, Malaysia is part of the. We have signed the treaty called CEDO, which is the Convention Against Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. We're also uh, part of the CRC Child Rights Convention. So we have signed. We we are not uh, known to sign many international co- co- convention, but these are two very important uh, convention that is uh, that we have signed, and we are proud of it. You know, when we go overseas, we talk about it, and so. Having signed that and having had uh, an Article 8 where the gender is introduced, what is your problem in having uh, in following the the judgment? So the excuse given is that oh um, you know we don't want to be bound by that decision because if we do, uh, if if we breach it, that we will be in contempt. Now why would you want to be in contempt of that judgment? Follow it because after all that. Means you are going to do the amendment, so you have a judgment that will reflect the policy and the amendment. What is wrong with that? That excuse so far has not been very good to say that you want to appeal. It's not very good. They should continue with the appeal. Uh, sorry, they should continue with the amending uh, part, but follow the judgment. Withdraw the appeal. What is so difficult about it? It's so blatant in its discrimination. One of the excuses they gave was that. Apparently, uh, that if a child is born overseas to a mother, that child uh, is eligible to have uh, what you call double nationality, right? Yeah, dual citizenship, yeah. yeah okay. Dual citizenship, uh, and in Malaysia we do not recognize a dual nationality. But so does the father. If the child is born to a Malaysian father, it's the same case. Yeah. There's no there's no situation where you know you're born to the uh, Malaysian father that child does not become uh, you know a citizen of that particular country that it was born to. So there's no logic. Seriously, there's no logic to it. And 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 let's imagine a mother, a Malaysian mother, has her first child born. Okay, she's married to say um, um, uh, an Irish person. All right, and that first child. Doesn't have Malaysian citizen because of this, uh, you know, this uh, discriminatory um, clause, and then she gave birth to her second child in Malaysia, and that child becomes Malaysian. So, what do you want the mother to do? Send one child back to Ireland? You know what happens? So, there's absolutely no logic. So, what I would say is that the government should, you know, the government's answer would be, oh no, 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 you can ap- you can apply. Under 15A, yes, you see, under the um, the Constitution, Part Three is where we're talking about citizenship. So one can become a citizen by way of um, application by registration. One can also be a citizen by naturalization. 
And the third one is what we are interested in, where you can be automatic citizen. So we're talking about kids who should be automatic citizen who are denied that. So you need yes. to apply. So what is, the, what is the minister trying to do? They are actually trying to play God. Okay, you apply, we will consider. But we have cases, you know, literally running into thousands of people who have applied, but either they are rejected or they've been waiting for two years, three years, four years, you know, six years. And then that if it is 15A, if that child crosses 21, they cannot apply under that clause again. So what happens? They will be denied everything. Once you are stateless, you do not have your citizen uh, citizenship. What happens to that child? Can't open a bank account, can't drive, can't sit for, uh, you know, national exams, can't, can't get a scholarship, you know, and can't travel. They don't have passport. So what happens? So really, these are some of these issues which I really wish we could have solved it. We did not, and it continues not to be solved. We'll wait and see uh, if this can be discussed in the parliament. Um, both sides should push for it. These are some, some of these issues that actually it matters. And these are the kind of issues that you should be fighting for in parliament. Not about when I get into power. It, you do it now. Don't say that if, you know, uh, when we get into power, we'll do it. Do it now. Yeah. This is a test. It, it sounds actually like a very serious issue because I was looking at the numbers according to the UNHCR, the number of stateless persons in Malaysia, and this is 2017, four years ago, was uh, 12,400. And the number did not include Sabah and Sarawak, where yes. potentially, uh, based on the found findings of the Sabah coalition, there could be an estimated 800,000 out of 3.9 million people in Sabah alone who are undocumented. Now, let's just look at one state. So 800,000 is is a lot of people um, which can swing either way because uh, if you look at human beings as an asset to your country uh, then you are denying 800,000 assets you know if, if you are if you're looking at human beings as, as a bane as a, a problem to the country then you are allowing 800,000 problems to run around to cause more problems yes so it seems like a very serious it seems like it should be top priority like within the top three lah. That should be the case. Yes, it should be. It should be. And 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 the thing is, I mean, not that we want to like uh, be an alarmist by saying it's eight hundred thousand. It could be way less if you deal with the issue of statelessness. There's two types of statelessness: people who are stateless in the in the country of origin, for example, the Rohingyas. They are double, you know, they are in double jeopardy. They are not recognized in the country of uh, where they came from, Myanmar, and then they come here and they are not given you know, basic protection. So that those are stateless people who we need to actually deal with and, and give protection. But you don't have to grant them citizenship. But we're talking about, uh, you know, people who are actually de facto um, Malaysians, but not given uh, the my card and not given the, the necessary birth certificate that would give you the rights as a Malaysian. So I'll give you, you know, it's, it's pure cruelty to deny a kid uh, for not knowing the origin of his parents, his or her parents. So we have kids who are adopted by parents at the age of 12. You and I would be able to go to the JPN and get your MyCA. You know, that's the most exciting time. You, you think you're going to be an adult by having this MyCA. So the kid goes in with the adopted parents and then the JPN officers will look at these parents and say, um, you know, I don't think you look like your child. Now, we are suspicious. We are suspicious. So we're going to have to interview both of you. And so they do. And that time, some of these parents have to, they break down. They will say, look, we didn't have kids. We took this child. And then, you know, we, we made the birth certificate as if the child is ours. So, yeah, the huge crime, you know, they, they decided to put themselves as the biological parents of the, of the child. So the... Uh, you know, JPN officers would say, look, we're sorry, we'll have to take back that uh, birth certificate and uh, correct the information and give you back. Meanwhile, you need to go and process the adoption. Fine. Still acceptable. We'll deal with that issue. But what happens from a green birth certificate that reflects you are a Malaysian citizen, that child will now be given a pink birth certificate. 
bukan warga negara. So overnight, that child becomes stateless because they put that bukan warga negara. Child was born here. The child was born here. He doesn't know his or uh, her parents or maybe was abandoned or given away. We don't know. But now you say, oh, no, no, we don't know. We need to know who the parents are. Why? Why does a child need to prove itself? You know, so these are the kind of things. Overnight, you treat the adopted parents, the parents who gave life to this kid, who took care of this kid as uh, a common criminal. And then on top of it, you deprive that child citizenship, which I must say, it is against the process in, in the constitution because you must not, you know, deny or deprive a person's citizenship and render that person stateless. That is actually in the constitution. But how do they do this? In a very smooth and surreptitious, uh, surreptitiously by saying we are amending your birth certificate and then pop, you're not only just amending the birth certificate, you change the green color to pink color. This is what's been happening. And, and, and it's sheer cruelty. To, to these children and some of them go through uh, mental anguish and you know from far you can see your birth certificate is not Malaysian birth certificate and that means you're different. Some kids are deprived of uh, entering a national library in a school trip. They can go to class but uh, sorry the library they need a card and that kid doesn't have a card you know. So these are, these are the things that's happening. So we need to do something and I do wish these are the kind of issues that both sides of, of, of the you know, uh, politics or government, uh, opposition, and take it as an issue and deal with it, you know? Not just say, oh, uh, it is an Indian issue. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a foreign, foreigner uh, issue. No, it is a Malaysian issue. We're talking about Malaysian parents who have got kids who are denied. We're talking about forcing the kids to suddenly find out they're actually adopted. That, that that whole thing is sheer cruel, cruelty, you know, upon these kids. How could one be subjected to those things? So just going back to the case you were talking about yeah. earlier, I, I presume that's a real case, so one of... Yes, yes. certainly. I, I'm just giving samples of, you know, yeah. every walking cases that I've had. We're just a small outfit, Lawyers for Liberty. There are many other organizations that deal with this. As a small outfit... I'm telling you here, we get at least two cases on a daily basis. You can imagine, you know, people who, who, who need help in sorting out the citizenship of their children or their sisters or their brothers. Two, two new cases on a daily basis. Yes. yes. And we don't have that capacity to deal with. It is a problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, whose problem is it? Is it immigration? Is it uh, Jabatan Pandaftaran? Is it... Uh, so, or does it take a coalition of different departments, or is it just purely a, a law thing where just the law needs to change? And you know, well, I don't think the law needs to change actually, because um, the constitution, when it comes to citizenship, is actually a well-drafted uh, section. Apart from so. the from the part where you have the word, um, you know, mother and father in one particular clause, that is when it uh, we're dealing with kids who are born overseas, but. Uh, other than that, we have all these clauses that actually guarantees you automatic citizenship. We're not talking about, you know, being granted citizenship, but automatic citizenship where the government recognizes, uh, the, the country recognizes you under the constitution. We have that. But the problem is that interpretation of those clauses. So we have one clause, which we call it the clause that protects stateless, statelessness where if you're born in Malaysia and you're not a citizen of any other country, then you ought to be deemed as Malaysian. That sounds fairly simple, right? For example, Rohingya. For example, not Rohingya. No. You're born in Malaysia, but you're not a citizen of any other country, then you are seen as Malaysian. So how do you determine whether you are not a citizen of any other country? One, for example, I don't know who my parents are. I've been adopted. That's one example. Okay. Or uh, my parents are not a uh, citizen of any other country. All right. Or I'm a foundling. Or I'm actually uh, a Malaysian. My, my father is Malaysian, 
uh, sorry, my father is Malaysian and my mother is a foreigner. I was born to them, but guess what? They're not married at the time I was born. So I am deemed illegitimate. So the clause says, there's an interpretation that if, if I am born to a foreign mother and a Malaysian father, if I am illegitimate, then I do not get you know, citizenship on certain clauses. But let's look at 1E. It doesn't talk about my parents at all, right? It doesn't refer to my parents at all. So where do I fall in? I'm not a citizen of any other country. I am born here. I should be Malaysian in that section, that particular section. But unfortunately, uh, while we have officers who goes overseas, um, you know, to talk about statelessness and we deal with all these things um, internationally, we always say, you know, we don't need any additional um, laws because we have a protection against statelessness. This is the clause. But when you go to court, it's the other way around. They will say, no, the kid has to prove that it's stateless. The kid has to prove that it's not a citizen of any other country. How do you do that? You have 200 over countries. You go to every embassy and say, am I um, a, a, your citizen? And then they will say, no. Are you supposed to collect 200 over uh, letters of rejection first before you come and give it to uh, and, and say, look, I've got 200 over countries who are saying I'm not a citizen of their country. Is that how it works? That's not the way it works. So the burden is shifted to that to that child to prove. So how do you deal with this? You know. So I think we can deal with it. The government knows how to do it. But unfortunately, every person who is not documented or denied are treated as just a foreigner. And when you're treated um, in Malaysia, if you're a foreigner, that, that itself is another big deal because we have uh, tendencies to be xenophobic. It's not just a policy in the, in the government, but it's, it's a policy outside how we treat people. You know, we have people uh, uh, being very xenophobic. Uh, while sounding very liberal in other issues, but when it comes to issues uh, with foreigners, suddenly, you know, your, your true color comes out. You know, how you deal with the Indonesians, how do you deal with the Bangladeshis or Rohingyas or whatever, Th that character comes out. It, it's a test. You, you will see it, you know. So, uh, yeah, so it's a double, uh, double thing for, for a person who's denied um, citizenship. Oh, <laughs> it sounds so simple and yet, and yet, it's not. Why is it not happening? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going I'm to jump topic here just because yeah. something crossed my mind personally. Back to the death sentence. Um, let's let's talk personally. Personally, uh, are you are you against the death sentence? In, in of any? Course. You are okay. Um, then. Okay. Yeah, it, it's been a law since what 60s, 70s, whenever the law. Why? What is stopping that you know, the death penalty being abolished? Is it just a, a, is it a law thing, or are we talking now about what what becomes tradition and culturally and how we are brought up? Because yeah, growing up, oh, oh yeah, hanging, hanging, drugs, hanging, gun, hanging. Yeah. I grew up that way. Thinking, yeah. yeah that, then only when I, you know, began to study overseas and, and laws and all that. Oh, you mean not every country does it this way? And then I, yeah. you know, we get to explore it. But I, I must admit, I grew up thinking, yeah, that's the way it's handled. Uh, so is that yeah. still the problem? It's just that we we're stuck in this period where we think this is this is the only one way to handle these things. And I think there are eight things or twelve things which are, are death penalty related. So what yeah. is the problem here? Well, okay. Um, firstly, I, 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 I'm I'm from the category of people who are uh, we call ourselves abolitionists when it comes to death penalty. Uh, today, 2nd October, um, is the birthday of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And he's famously known to have said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. So having said that, what is the death penalty? It's basically, um, to put it crudely, is state murder. You are taking vengeance or revenge against someone who have probably done murder or you know having guns or drugs i mean drugs is the most unjustified um uh, uh, uh offense to to kill that person but then again it is state murder because not just about the cruelty but it is it is proven it's not a deterrent 
have we i mean how many people we have hanged for drugs have we stopped people uh, you know trafficking no i don't think so and have we stopped people from killing each other no so nobody you know before they kill they say wait i'm not going to kill because there's a hanging sentence here no it doesn't work that way people don't kill or stop killing because they realize there's a there's a hanging uh, 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 you know sentence there what happens is that they stop doing things if they are caught so it is about enforcement it is about dealing with the crime a lot of people say oh how i mean you you don't know how the victim feels you know what if you are the victim what would you have said well we're not letting them free we're not saying that let them go free you know they are going to be in prison they will still face sentences do you think um you know being sentenced for life is not cruel enough what gives you the idea that by hanging someone until they break their neck is going to satisfy and bring back the person who's dead no so where is the deterrence so it's sheer cruelty and basically majority of countries in the world we have entered into 2021 and there is no death penalty but malaysia singapore china indonesia we still have it and are we proud of it we could have we had that opportunity to get rid of it in 2018 i can say but we didn't why didn't we do it what's the excuse is it because it's unpopular did politicians suddenly took fright because um there was a survey that says oh most people want death penalty come on that this, that argument pros and cons can be dealt with you had the power it all it takes again is a simple majority to abolish and in fact the minister at that time announced we will we will have it we will abolish but we didn't there was a u turn and until now if you know these people who have had that opportunity to sort that out didn't do it why would i want to believe you again you know and, but we have to push it we still have to push it and the more people understand that death penalty is not a deterrent i think even before 2018 the government uh, then was also talking about commissioning uh, I, i think i think they did a commission uh, uh, the attorney general's chambers had uh, did a commission uh, commission for a survey and a study whether death penalty is actually working you know and i do believe that uh, that was the case it wasn't working and they they were going to see alternative um, sentences uh, for deterrence but it was not carried out that's a sad part because ultimately it is the most cruel of all sentences because you cannot undo it if it was imprisonment if you found that person was actually innocent you can undo it but if you have hanged them you can't bring them back have you worked on any cases which uh, involved the death death penalty yes i have i've taken up um, drug cases um, which involves death penalty are, are you able to share of any personal story or uh, experience that you know particularly heartbreaking or heartwarming Well uh in in my case uh I'm happy to say that the, the case I I've, I've done um we managed to uh um uh, uh, you know uh, uh get acquitted so that was a good story but I was in court when we hear people who have been acquitted and then their sentences that has been reversed to you know um that sentences over some technicalities or some you know presumption in the law that uh makes them guilty so no second chances that's the sad part you know so yeah and and i i i don't see why the current government cannot do something about it we have thousands languishing thank god we still have a moratorium at the moment but when once that is lifted and i hope you know i really hope it won't be lifted you know all these people um what's going to happen people make me When you say a moratorium, I mean there's a moratorium on on the death um on the death sentence and it's been there for a long time until uh you know they decide uh, the moratorium is for death sentences for uh drug offenses and majority 
those uh, a majority of, of those who are sentenced uh, are for the trafficking offenses so yeah so i think we should we should get rid of it at least start with that you know okay uh, there is obviously going to be some opposition to the abolishment of the death penalty. Where is yes. that opposition coming from and why is it so strong? Well, of course, it is the old, um, you know, uh, issue of uh, wanting justice uh, and, um, you know, vengeance and the, the concept of, you know, uh, an eye for an eye. That, that, that's the basic, uh, uh, I think that's the main uh, basis for that. For a family to actually want something against that, um, the, the perpetrator or, or, or the accused, we can understand. But for the state, with all its apparatus, to carry out that vengeance, that vengeful process, it, it, in a cold-blooded manner, to hang that person, on behalf of that family, I, I think it's it's absolutely barbaric, absolutely barbaric. Once upon a time, you would see, you know, uh, in, of course, in in historical stories where you know people hang or burn the witches or hang someone, so that you know you watch people doing it. But now it's all hidden. You hear of it, you don't see it, but the cruelty is still the same. You put someone. You hood someone, and then you tie the the noose, and then you snap their their neck, and then that's it. It's all done in a very cold, efficient manner, and then you get a doctor to check whether the person has uh, has died. And all this happens, and and the sentencing happens after probably ten years in prison. You know, they would have served ten years, fifteen years, waiting to be sentenced. How cruel can that be? During that time, that person could have turned into a, 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 a new person. You know, um, they, they could have uh, gone through a, a process, regretting, we don't know. But after all that, you still hang that person. How, how can that be acceptable in this time? You know, so it's, it's absolutely uncivilized. So these, these pro-death penalty people, um, that will always be that. You will always have that. Bring back death penalty. We have that in other countries. They will say, bring back death penalty uh, for the terrorists, for the rapists, child killers, whatever you call it. But that has never been a deterrent. You know? So it's a lack of political will, I would say. And you want to be popular or you want to deal with it? You know? If you think that you need to just address a, a group of people who are pro, uh, that that's not principled. In issues of human rights, you can't always take the popular move. You know, you you can't. Once you are a person with power, then do it, you know, properly with the power that you have, and be principled about it and defend it after that. Okay, uh, we've covered uh, quite some ground actually in this in this episode just before we end uh I'm, I'm going by what i'm hearing you've mentioned two or three times inverted commas we had a chance to make a difference or to change the law but we didn't and you know you refer to the pakatan harapan government uh i for one I will, to be honest i was like oh she's sounding almost like i thought you were part of pakatan so uh what I thought you were part of Pakatan in, in that realm, but you seem very disappointed with that uh, period of time, the, the 22 months. Um, now we are, we've moved on. We're uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what to call the current government. Is I presume it's PN. But I, on a personal note, watching the political games and the political maneuvers, uh, are you confident that we are at least heading in the right direction in, in terms of the good for the country? It's very hard for me to say. Um, you know, things change very fast. Over the last um, three years, I would say we have three prime ministers. So <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But one mm -hmm. thing for sure, people are far more 
um, you know, uh, sharp when it comes to dealing with um, politicians. Um, you know, they are more demanding. You can hear uh, the government being whacked every day in the newspapers. Um, so much for, uh, you know, being able to talk about it. They, you, you, you know, every every um, popular media portal they can talk about it, bring up issues, government uh, officials or politicians, they've all got tweets, they've all have access to media. You know, you have that direct uh, uh, ability to, to speak about it and, and, and do that. So in a way, I think um, there's a plus point of all this shakeup and whatever that has happened. But uh, it, we, have to, we have to still fight for it. We have to still campaign for issues. But I think we have to stop thinking that there's a messiah that's going to save us. No, I, I don't believe in this coming of a messiah. Once this person or that person becomes the prime minister, everything will be solved. I don't think we can do that anymore. You know, no more, no more that that kind of um, uh, <coughs> push for change. We change yeah. because we need to change, and we bring those things and call up or call out people who have not done it and continue to do so, you know? Um, yeah, for me, for me, it's that. It's, um, and, and I think as NGOs or uh, civil societies, we have a role to play and we must step out from this whole partisan uh, politics. You can talk about politics. You can talk about change of government, but let's, you know, stay above that whole partisan thing. It's like, it's not like one person or one group is, are made of angels and the other person is all of evil. We have both sides. Having, you know, gone through that, I think we, as a society, we have matured to not think that there's only one or two person that can save this country. And therefore, we should be able to decide uh, in an informed manner in the next uh, election. Let's hope. Yeah, uh, I, I I will agree with you. Uh, one side is never all angels, and the other side all devils. However, I may argue with you on your point that we have matured to a point that we can we can uh, see and understand this because every time someone says, "Yeah, you know what? We'll just wait for the next election." Yeah, everything's going to change. Yeah, I'm say I, I, no, no. No, no, I agree. It's not all about just the election and what happens after elections also. Yeah. But the idea that, you know, uh, if you're going to give, if I'm going to support you because you have got a wonderful uh, uh, manifesto, no, we've gone through that. If I'm going to support you because people say, this group is so bad that anyone is better, we've gone through that as well, you know. And uh, and I would think let's let's look at what what is out there uh, the issue of being principled about things you know don't don't give us sweet things to say you know don't give us sweet words and expect us to support you that's what I'm saying um, we have um, well let's put it this way how do you become wiser when you are I would think that you are wiser when you are. Um, uh, betrayed. If a person is betrayed, they become wiser. Well, I don't know about you, but if you have been betrayed before, you would have become wiser. I would say that in politics, in politics, you know, that that would be one way to look at it. You know? my, my wife is in the corner. Going, She's right. She's right. In love as well. I mean, in in friendship as well. If yeah. you are betrayed, don't tell me you're going to be betrayed the same way. I don't think so. Mm, so interesting. So mm. it's about uh, going through the process. I I just want to uh, reiterate uh, uh, what you just said something earlier, which actually uh, is forming in my mind. You said, "Don't come at us with manifestos. We've been through that. Don't come at us with look how bad uh, this person is. Anything is better than that." we've been through that, come at us with principles, come at us with, uh, uh, you know, uh, thoughts and, and uh, you didn't say political will, but I'm, I'm use a word like that. I, 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 I like that, actually, because you're right. Um, those two tactics you mentioned earlier on, 
we've, we've done that, been there, done that, didn't quite work out. And that's what I think is important for, the, for us or us as Malaysians to look for in the next election is let us pick up teams or groups of people or lead to parties, can't say the whole party, of certain people who are leaders who are, you know, at least we go, yeah, this, this person's got principles. Uh, and, you know, we haven't done that, have we? I think I since think 1957. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I'm going back there. So, uh, well, number one, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, this this hour and a 15 minutes with us. Is there anything you'd like to say that we've not covered or before we leave, before we say goodnight, is there anything you'd like to bring up? Uh, if I start, I cannot stop talking. So, oh, no. <laughs> uh, the, you, you and Chef One. The, that's not oh, no. Not stop. <laughs> <laughs> I like him. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I had him uh, on my show last week. With Chef One, I only have, need to start with one question, and two hours later, we just say goodnight because. <laughs> That's all he needs. Uh, Radiva Koya, thank you so much for spending uh, this time with us. Uh, and uh, all the best um, with Lawyers for Liberty. And you know what? One day I do hope that we are able to have a conversation in the near future where we go, hey, you remember when we said that should change? And look at it now. It's, it's changed. You know, that, yeah. that would be my wish as well. So thank you again. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Uh, bye. We'll talk to you real soon. Take care. Okay. Thank you. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, a lawyer, activist, uh, human rights, uh, lawyers for liberty, etc., etc., and ex-MACC chief, Latifa Koya. Um, yeah, I particularly like what she said right at the end, you know, about how to choose our next uh, government or leadership is, is based on those of us who have principles. I hope you have enjoyed the show. If you're still watching, thank you so much. Thank you. I saw the numbers going up right towards the end again. So thank you so much for joining in again. Please, if you have not done it, please do me a huge favor. Appreciate you forever. Share this episode. And if you're watching this uh, episode, not on October 2nd, not on a Saturday night, after that, Thank you for, for tuning in and clicking. I, I've heard a lot of people tell me that uh, they watch the next day and they just turn it on in the background uh, and they and they listen to the audio as well. So thank you again. Um, and just for your information, I will be releasing all the audio footage, audio clips from the show on a podcast called What's Going On Malaysia? What a surprise right there. Guys, Thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, I'm really enjoying reading all the comments, especially after the show. Today Today has been uh, particularly eye-opening for me. Um, if you were, were not watching earlier, please go back and watch the earlier part of the episode where uh, my guest Lativa Koya spoke about how it feels to once be against the MACC and you know, sue them for something and then be in the MACC and then come out later and then actually realize, actually, there's so many different pieces to the cake. There's so many different departments, you know, and, and it's always better to have um, an understanding of that. And also, quote of the day. What was that, Sayang? Um, yeah, how to, <laughs> you will become wiser if you have been betrayed. Jeng, jeng, jeng. I wonder who she's talking about. Hmm. Inquiring minds would like to know. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Harith Iskander. Thank you, Ellen Hashtan. Thank you, Sunny Ng, Henry Yam. Uh, Suka, Suka Maran Raman says, I have four children. None of them are in Malaysia. I, I'm sorry to hear that, Suka Maran. I hope you want them in Malaysia. That's why you commented none of them are in Malaysia. Uh, thank you, Jaya. Thank you, uh, Sian Chung. Uh, thank you, Alvin. Oh, thank you, everyone, for watching the show. Uh, please follow my Facebook. I'm also on Twitter, at Harith Iskander. Uh, and have you subscribed to the YouTube, Harith Iskander Comedy? And get all the latest updates and find out when the next episode of What's Going On Malaysia is coming on. Uh, as usual, I do the show because... I'm looking for the answer to the question, what's going on Malaysia? Um, and today, 
Have we answered the question? I think not, but we are definitely a lot closer to being a little bit wiser in our thoughts about our country, Malaysia. So once again, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum. Uh, and if you're out there on the streets, back at work, please continue to uh, adhere to all the SOPs, specifically about wearing masks and social distancing and washing your hands. That still applies, even though all of you are out there. I was out there. I met all of you out there in Malaysia. Thank you. Good night. Assalamualaikum. I'll see you guys real soon. Take care. Bye, Terry Tur. Last good night.